Hello and welcome to my Where in the World is Carmen San Diego Sean Altman interview. Now, this interview was done via Zoom, and anyone who's ever used Zoom knows that it's not a perfect system. Sometimes you'll get weird audio anomalies or video freezing. So if you see any weird cuts in this, that's just from me trying to edit around that stuff, although I definitely wasn't able to fix everything. Also, you will notice a slight change in the audio on Sean's side, and that's because he started the interview on a cell phone and then that died partway through and he had to switch to the PC. So it just, there's a slight change in the audio sound there. Um, anyway, I do hope that you enjoy this interview as I had a lot of fun doing it. Um, and thank you to anyone that actually managed to submit questions before the interview because it was very, it was a very last minute thing when I threw that up. Uh, so I did ask all those questions there near the end of the interview. Something miraculous happened. I don't know if it's miraculous, but it is awesome. And uh, that is that I, I reached out to the man, the myth, the legend, <laughs> the writer, <laughs> uh, co-writer of the Carmen Sandiego theme song and uh, former member of Rockapella, Sean Altman, not expecting to receive a response. And this beautiful man uh, got back to me rather quickly and agreed to do this interview here. So, um, Sean, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to chat with that me. That is the kind of, that's the kind of accessible rock star that I am. You know, if you'd written to Paul McCartney or Mick Jagger, no way you'd get a response, much less be talking with them on Zoom the <laughs> next morning. <laughs> Absolutely true. And that's why those guys will never make it. That's true. That's true. That, look, I don't, I don't sing their, their songs on the daily. <laughs> there you go. So let's go ahead and kick it off. Um, I, so I'm going to ask you a question. That's not, it's not music related, but I have to know. And I think, I feel yes. like, you know, because you were there. Okay. okay. So yes. it, it, it's bugged me. Um, so I, I, I also watched uh, your guys cast reunion that you did on the um, host at home. Uh, and I watched yeah. one other reunion that you did. And I remember in that reunion, you guys mentioned that one of your favorite parts of the show um, was doing the uh, where where you would do the the loot, the the warrant and the the located like the, the criminal. And you guys would improvise right. to try to make Greg laugh. And so you would be standing just off camera to do that. Um, my question and we can talk a little bit about that, too, because that was sure that was great info. But. My question is, in that scene, when you watch it on TV, um, obviously that board with the trilons on it is there's no screen on there. But when you watch it on TV, an image of the chief would show up and there would be a video of her talking about the location and then it would cut back. So I, I was wondering, was there actually like a monitor somewhere playing that video or were the act where the contestants and Greg just pretending to watch something and then they just spliced that footage in? Do you guys remember? Huh. Footage of the chief saying. Yeah, basically the... just she would just be oh. mentioning stuff about the the location that the um, that the criminal was in. Just, uh, you know, like that's a really good question. I, I don't recall there being a monitor there, but it's possible that there was, but I, I don't recall it. So I think that maybe, so is it possible that they could have watched the chief's explanation before they got to the mid game area? I mean, or, I would or, think so. Huh. Uh, I, I, I you know, this, is, this is the question. <laughs> There's, this is the question that I could, first of all, Greg, Greg Lee would know. Howard Blumenthal, who was the producer and one of the creators, he would know, and probably <laughs> any of the writers would know. And I'm happy to put you in touch with them. I don't specifically remember there being a monitor with the chief's face on it at the mid-game position. Okay. Yeah, I figured it was like the way that it's presented on the show. I felt like they probably just filmed the contestants and Greg just looking at the board for a few minutes or like a, for, you know, 30 seconds or something like that. And then they would just cut yeah. in video footage with them looking and splice it together. But I wasn't sure. And I, I didn't know if you'd know. <laughs> I, I don't remember that, but here's one. Here's one. When the show ended, I'm not sure how I ended up with this. I'm not sure. I don't know for a fact that I stole it, but I may have stolen it. 
I can't say, for, you know, I wish I remembered if I actually stole it, but this is, there were two <laughs> warrants. This was this one and a backup. That's and I awesome. somehow, I, I, I actually ended up with the actual warrant, which is <laughs> one of I my, can't... uh, one of my treasures. And I can't see that without hearing you guys singing the warrant. <laughs> you know, the story of how that song came about is one of my favorite um, Carmen San Diego stories. So we they, the show hired us to be the in-house band and they said we needed music and we want you guys to write it. So then there were a whole bunch of meetings about what kind of music and for every, we knew that they wanted uh, every crook to have their own theme song. So like, this is Vic the Slick. And so we gave him kind of like a jazzy thing. It was like, ba ba do ba do Vic the Slick. Um, and then for the warrant, I remember sitting in this room in, uh, it was on East 28, West 28th Street in Manhattan with Howard Blumenthal, the producer. And he's telling us how the mid game works. And he says, and then when they flip the, flip the thing over and the kid gets the warrant we need some sort of musical sting and i completely as a joke said how about the warrant and he said yeah that's good and that was it <laughs> i was it was completely a joke on my part you know, how, you know like how goofy how goofy could it be that it would be so literal <laughs> and that but that ended up being one of the themes of the show that we said the warrant in three part harmony. And uh, I'm very proud of that moment. It's it's a great segment. And then in hearing the, that you guys would also uh, prepare a bunch of, of cues for uh, was it the loot, I think, was it the loot? Yeah. And, and try to make Greg laugh with those. Um, I think it was amazing. Did, uh, did that take a lot We of didn't time? have a, um, we didn't have a specific sting for the loot. So if we didn't have anything to say, we would usually just say the loot. And, but it, the game could go on for a long time. And sometimes mm -hmm. because you had to get, you had to get the loot, the warrant, the crook in that order. So if you got the loot later, you would have to, you know, you would have to, if, if they were trying to find the crook and they, they knew where the loot and the warrant was, you could have each contestant saying, getting the loot and the warrant five or six times before they found um, yeah. the crook. So it was boring for us to keep saying the loot. So we started using the melody of the warrant to use wordplay uh, uh, regarding whatever the loot was. So uh, <laughs> one of my favorites was, there's a favorite, there's a famous um, statue of a, of a little boy peeing. And I think it's in Brussels called Munkin Piss, Munkin Peas. And it's a famous statue. It's an international tourist destination of a fountain in Belgium with a little boy peeing. And that was what Carmen stole. And so we came up with all of these <laughs> pee, <laughs> um, these slightly risque pee jokes like, um, <laughs> European yeah. and uh, <laughs> you know, just a whole bunch of things like that. And, and, and they, for the first few seasons, they never used to check what our, what our, uh, our list of things was. And then at some point we started maybe pushing the envelope and they were getting a little bit scatological. And so at that point, one of the producers right before the mid game would come down and look at them and sometimes he'd cross one out saying no can't say that <laughs> but for the most part those were uh that was our one of our only writing contributions to the show did uh i and i know the object was to you know to make greg laugh did they did the kids ever get a giggle out of it or did a lot of it just fly over their heads i think a lot of it flew over their heads and also remember if you're a contestant there you're so focused on trying yeah. to win. Um, it's true. And we were, so if you're looking at the mid game, that concentration board, if you're looking at it, we were, Greg is on the right mm -hmm. and we were off camera on the left. So we were facing Greg. So we would see Greg's expressions and we would, uh, you know, the, the kids 
we wouldn't really pay attention to them because our goal was just to make sure that when it came time to sing something, we were right there. In fact, yeah. there's a there's a little bit of footage of us, maybe on one of those reunion things of us off camera, and you can see that we're in like this sports, you know, like a sprinter about to go. We're just like, you know, with the pitch pipe handy and like the warrant, you know, when we're pointing at the card and giving each other visual clues about so that we sound tight and we came in when we were supposed to. Yeah. Yeah. The timing on that must have been uh, difficult. It was fun. It was like a little, uh, it always got our hearts rates up a little bit because if you didn't see us, it was mm -hmm. typically pre-recorded. That, that lute Warren Crook was one of the few things that we did live in the studio, but like the thinking music, the think about it, how much you gonna risk. That was all pre-recorded. So, yeah. uh, yeah, I mean, that yeah. would be exhausting if you guys had to sing every, <laughs> every cue and stay oh, yeah. on it all day. And also, guys... it, 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 it does a really, it would be very challenging for them to always have an engineer mixing us. Oh, yeah. So, and as you know, the theme song was always lip synced because the theme song had to be look and sound or had to sound the exact same every time. Mm -hmm. And that always bothered us a little bit because we didn't like having to lip sync to our own voices on camera. So yeah. after a while, we got really lazy, intentionally lazy with the lip sync. Uh, and sometimes, you know, you'll see us intentionally trying to look like those old um, Saturday, Saturday Night Live spoofs of Godzilla movies where people are saying like, look, it's Godzilla. You know, your your mouth moves a second <laughs> yeah. after you hear the thing. Speaking of the theme song, I did want to um, ask you about that. So I, I know that um, I know that you co-wrote that uh, with your friend and fellow musician David Yazbek. Um, what? So when they asked you to write the theme song for the show, did they did they provide you with parameters like you need to include? so many geographical locations or the kind of references for no. the, the lyrics or was that that was just all you guys uh they they gave us very little guidance um and they you know they told us the theme of the show which is that carmen is an international crook and she leads a gang and she goes all around the globe stealing things and um and they said to Rockapella, you know, hey, we want you guys to come up with something. Um, we were a little bit, we were all green. Not, and none of us had much songwriting experience at all. And, but I came up with that. I came up with, with this couplet. Well, she sneaks around the world from Kiev to Carolina. Tell me where in the world is Carmen San Diego on a jet plane to New York or a slow boat to China. Tell me where in the world is Carmen San Diego and a couple of other ideas. And I went to the best songwriter I knew, my friend David Yazbek, who uh, had been writing songs since he was a teenager. And we had been in a, uh, a teenage Simon and Garfunkel style duo in high school and in college. And I, I said to him, Hey, I've got these ideas. They want, uh, they want Rockapella to, you know, they, they want, they, they put it in our hands to write music. And I've got a few ideas for theme songs. And I played him a couple of ideas and he said, that's the one. And he said, and, and I'd love to work with you on it. And that was a really good opportunity for me because I had never, I had probably written only two songs in my life. And here was an accomplished songwriter friend of mine. And uh, so he took my little kernel of the thing and we both just went to work. And uh, our our groove inspiration was the Jane's Addiction song, Caught Stealing, which was a big hit in, I guess, 1990 or 91. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. 90 or 91. And the groove was like, and that was one of the grooves of the moment. And so <laughs> somehow that got translated into who up, who boobay, who, which is pretty funny because who up, who boobay, who up sounds very doo up -y. 
Mm-hmm. But in Yazbek's in my head, we had that, you know, we had this funky, gritty groove underneath it, which didn't quite translate, but that was our inspiration. Did it take and then after that, it was just a lot of work. It was a lot of wordplay. Mm-hmm. Did it take a long time to? Uh, he came up with. No, uh, maybe once we had the structure, um, it was his idea. The that whole bridge, the Nashville to no way binder to that whole chromatic thing. That mm-hmm. was that was uh, beyond my musicality, and that's that was, you know, one of the main things that Yazbek brought to that was not only you know how to structure the song well for television but that really interesting bridge which happens twice in the song um and then i I think he and i probably worked on it maybe for a couple of sessions before we had all the lyrics written down somewhere i have our handwritten worksheet with all of these couplets and ones that we rejected but it was mostly trying to come up with those interesting things like steal their soul in south korea soul Seoul, South Korea, that or right. steal the beans from Lima, you know, the Lima bean reference and uh uh make ant make Antarctica cry uncle. It was all <laughs> just clever puns. And you know, Yazbek is a is a great lyricist. And since then I've been I've gotten my accolades as a lyricist too. Uh and we pretty much, you know, we we wrote the lyrics together and uh I don't even remember at this point what which couplets were his and which were mine, but it was quite even. But um, without him, there would have been a song, but it, it wouldn't have been nearly as good. <laughs> was it um, when you guys like submitted it? Was it immediately they like they were like yes, that's that's the thing, or did they did they have you guys make any further? changes or anything like that or was it just like uh, i don't think I, I i don't recall if they had us make any lyric changes they may have but yazbek and i we wrote the song and then he and i did an acapella demo i i haven't heard that acapella demo in years but i'd, I'd, I'd really love to hear it because that would indicate how much of the of that of his and my original work ended up being the thing I, and I played it for Rockapella. Rockapella liked it. And, you know, we were all kind of novices and there was a real time pressure mm-hmm. to, to get the theme song going. We didn't know that the theme song would be so featured. We didn't know that we'd be singing it on camera. We didn't know that the that the contestant would yell, do it, Rockapella. You know, all of that was just in development. Uh, and who knows if we had given them a theme song that they didn't like as much, maybe they they wouldn't have featured it so much. Uh, one thing's for sure, but the fact that we sang it on camera every day uh, and having the, the the kid yell, do it, Rockapella, it was a huge boost for both the song and for Rockapella's career. Mm. Because, you know, had we been off camera, then it, the song wouldn't have been as big a success. And, you know, we went from playing little clubs and cabarets in New York to playing theaters all over the country in a matter of you know a year. So. Yeah, you guys were uh, and I uh, like look, I I love the I love the show and I love Greg and I love Lynn on there, but Rockapella was the show. I mean that's it's one of those things like I I found myself when I was doing my retrospective, I got to the end of it and I had mentioned the theme song so many times. I was like I don't know if I just loved the show or if I just loved Rockapella. <laughs> <laughs> but did you guys before um I mean you were all musicians but when you were on the show as the house band I mean you were used in so many different facets in doing skits and doing comedy and stuff like that was that something that you guys all had a background in beforehand or was that like all new for you guys and and how did that change the way you performed well when we auditioned for the for the role of the house band they had us each do uh some acting things in fact i remember specifically that they had us each audition for the role of the dying informant because that was one of the the routines that they 
that they knew um, was going to be in the show. And I have very little acting background. I was in a couple of music, you know, I don't know, three or four musicals in high school, mostly because I could sing. But I, I've never considered myself an actor. Barry Carl, the bass, and Scott Leonard, the high tenor, though, they both had had quite a lot of experience. And as a result, those two guys got most of the of the good acting roles and they deserved it. They were good. I mean, Barry played numerous characters. He played the big baby, the uh, uh, Kafka, the Roach, Mrs. Pumpkin Clanger. Yeah. Um, <laughs> there's a whole bunch. Uh, he did the voiceover announcing. You know, ba Barry is a a very skilled and seasoned actor. Uh, and Scott was great. So Scott did the Dying Informant. Scott also did the Word on the Street. You know, it's not just being a good actor. You actually have to know how to memorize lines. <laughs> so yeah. uh, Elliot and I weren't nearly as good. Uh, but, you know, the show is, the writers were nice and they, they threw me and Elliot Kerman each a few bones. You know, I got to do, a, there was a recurring character that I did called the Delivery Guy who would deliver something to Greg and then sing a song. And then Elliot uh, played, uh, you know, he was Elvis in a skit and, um, but Mo Scott and Barry, they, they got the, they got the plum acting roles because they, they knew how to act. <laughs> but yes, it was part of the audition process and we knew it was going to happen. Did that change the way that you guys would perform musically? Uh, did you, did you incorporate comedy and stuff like that into um, those kind of performances or was it well we always even rockapella early rockapella rockapella formed in 1986 the original incarnation was four guys who had sunk together at brown university me um elliot kerman who was also on karma san diego steve kais the high tenor who was cast on carmen san diego but then quit because he didn't, in order to be in Carmen San Diego, he would have had to have dropped out of law school mm. and he didn't want to drop out of law school. So he left the group and that's when we held auditions and Scott Leonard, the high tenor came in. Uh, and the, and the, uh, there were two different um, founding base members, David Sticks and Charlie Evett, who were uh, each one, each one of those guys was in the group for about two years. Comedy was always a big part of the show. Okay. We always had a lot of shtick. In fact, the early incarnations of Rockapella, 1986, 1988, we would go on stage at these little cabaret clubs in New York City with a whole suitcase full of props, you know, disguises and googly eyeballs and funny hats and <laughs> inflatable props. Um, so comedy was always a big, a big part of it. Uh, and we were, discovered by the Carmen San Diego producers on a PBS uh, documentary about acapella music called Spike Lee and Company Do It Acapella. And in that documentary, which aired on PBS nationally in 1991, Rockapella sang uh, three or four songs. And two of them were very comedic. One was a uh, was a song called Zombie Jamboree, which we performed on Carmen San Diego a couple of times. Mm -hmm. So it's a Calypso novelty song about zombies coming back from the dead and having a big party. It was a zombie jamboree took place in the New York cemetery. And an, another was a song called Flat Tire, which is about a, a date gone awry because the, the guy who's driving the car with his date gets a flat tire. And the way we presented those songs on Spike and Company Do It a cappella was all shtick. All these funny movements and everything. So one of the reasons we got hired for Carmen San Diego was because they knew we could be funny. And they knew that we could that we that we weren't a you know a traditional doo-op group, that we were comfortable physically and that there was there was shenanigans involved. I assume there was a lot of uh, a lot of that going on behind the scenes shenanigans. That is, was it a it was a fun fun working environment? Uh, yeah, it was fun. Um, we were on a real schedule. 
there was they they were trying to remember we were shooting five episodes a day. Mm -hmm. There would be a morning session where they would do two or three shows with one audience, and they would move the kids around to make it look like a different audience. And then there would be a lunch break of maybe an hour, and then they would bring in a whole separate audience and do two or three shows in the afternoon. So it wasn't like we were all goofing around backstage the whole time. It was usually frantically preparing for what was coming up. Yeah. Uh, all of those musical clues that Rockapella did, we we would typically, they would give us the list of the songs that needed to, that we would do those vocal arrangements for. And we would, we would get together backstage or, or on an off day and just create these short arrangements of like a minute each out of thin air. And we became very facile at arranging on the fly for our group, you know, figuring out how to, how to make it sound good and how to make it sound true to our style. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, typically during, during the day, during the episodes, we had a, a stage manager who would say, okay, Rockapella, come out on the set. You're on to do the, the chase in three minutes. And we would go out there, we'd do the chase. And then he would say, okay, you're off for the next about 40 minutes. We'd go back to our own dressing rooms and uh, two or three of us, maybe all four of us had portable recording studios in our dressing rooms because we were working on music. Hmm. Uh, I, I recorded most of my first solo album in my dressing room at Carmen San Diego <laughs> during season four and season five. Oh, wow. Like if you walked into my dressing room, you would see like this big mixing board and a microphone and, you know, and I had like my own bathroom and shower, but um, it wasn't like we were hanging out uh, in a green room backstage. Everyone right. kind of retreat, retreated to his own cubby hole. Aside from when you guys were on camera, did you have much interaction with the audience? Like, was there any? No. I always imagine that fact, they... we weren't allowed. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, because uh, game shows, because of the, the, in the, I guess it was in the 50s or 60s, there were a bunch of game show scandals mm -hmm. where, where um, game shows were fixed uh, or people were bribed so that other people could win prizes. So there's actually, there's actually laws surrounding game shows. And in order to adhere to those laws, um, uh, one of the things, it was made known to us that we were never, ever allowed to interact with any contestants before the shows. If we would walk down the hallway and we would see a contestant, you'd have to like not even say a word. The idea was that even if we accidentally were humming a song that was used in a clue, somehow that might Oh yeah. Uh, tip off a contestant. So um, we weren't allowed to interact with the contestants at all. And we, we weren't were... even really allowed to, we never went into the audience. Yeah. So we, the, the only time we went into the audience was uh, after the, after the map run, then we would yeah. run into the audience and we would lip sync the theme song and try to get everybody excited. Okay. Yeah. Was it, so I, I imagine for an for any kind of audience situation like i know that like uh, warm-up comedians are a thing for like tv shows and stuff like that do they have somebody like that for the audience on, yes. on carmen san diego yeah they had uh there was always an audience warm-up it was usually a, a comic mm. uh in fact one of the audience warm-up guys mike Shoot, I forgot his last name. I think he's now, he's one of the head writers for one of the late night shows. Oh, wow. I mean, he might be the head writer for Late Night with Jimmy Fallon or The Late Show with Stephen Colbert. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, in fact, we, they were all, they weren't successful comics because if you were a successful comic, you wouldn't take that gig. Right. But but they were all working comics mm -hmm. who knew how to do crowd work and who knew how to how to um uh how to interact with an audience. But that it was an important 
role because the audience needs to to get into the mood to laugh. And also yeah. the audience needed very specific instructions as any television audience do, does about when to laugh. You know, there were applause signs mm -hmm. uh, and th the the audience shots were a big part of the show. Yep. So yeah. there was a whole lot of uh, logistical business that had to take place and the audience warm up person, that was their job. Yeah, I imagine, especially for those ending sequences, because if you are using, if you're filming two to three shows with the same audience, you know, and they have to try to get that energy up for for the big yeah. ending, you know. Yeah. yeah. Also, you know, the first couple of seasons, the first season, the kids who were in the audience, they didn't know the theme song. Mm -hmm. After that, the whole audience knew the theme song because they had already been watching the show for a year. So then, after season one, it became really easy to get people psyched because everyone knew the the theme song. Everybody knew to yell, do it, Rockapella. Oh, yeah. And everybody wanted to dance on the map. Yeah. No, that's the, the thing that stands out to me most is like, I, I, I all I wanted to do is just shout, do it, Rockapella. <laughs> 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 it's like the, yeah. the high point of the of each episode <laughs> like win or lose i don't care just just show, show me the camera <laughs> yeah have you seen um there's a there's a viral clip of that incarnation of rockapella the carmen san diego rockapella on i think it, it's a morning show like um cbs or i think it's abc i think it was abc good morning america and it's been making the rounds for about two years. We're not in our Carmen San Diego outfits, but it's during the Carmen San Diego era, and we're singing the theme song, and it's gone viral on, on TikTok and on Instagram, and I mean, it keeps getting excerpts of it are going around because we look, you know, we've got the crazy mullet hairdos, and I've got the braids, and the comments of all of those are so funny because everyone is just hating on our hairdos and our style. You know, it was, the, it was the mid nineties. It was a different yeah. time. Yeah. Um, so that my hairdo with the braids at the time was not considered cultural appropriation. Now I could never wear a hairdo like that. I, I'd be canceled in a second, but uh, it's amazing how 30 years after that show has gone off the air, that the theme song and some elements of that show continue and are beloved yeah no for sure um in fact one of my uh viewer questions that i have for you uh relates to music and how you know it stays with kids so let me let me go ahead and throw it over there because I'm, I'm already a little bit over how long i wanted to keep you to begin with um uh, okay so i have i think just three or four questions here uh this one is from ripster 87 who says they're curious to know how it felt being involved with a production like that. Did it feel like it was part of something special? Did it feel like it was the launching of, of your career? And, um, uh, and then they go on to say that uh, they, they hope that, you know, how much music sticks with kids. Uh, he says he knows that, um, that he sings the where in the world of Carm is Carmen San Diego theme song like now as an adult when he's just around the house doing stuff oh that's nice to hear um well there's a <laughs> the the funny thing for rockapella about getting cast on a kid's show was that before we got cast on that show we had we had already been a group for five years mm -hmm. kids hated us before that so that was the the bitter irony about us going from playing local clubs and we were doing weddings and bar mitzvahs and stuff like that. But we would typically, you know, we were, we were uh, doing doo-wop and old R&B and a few originals. And the audience that liked us was typically, you know, middle-aged yeah. or older. So we would get hired to sing at a bar mitzvah just for the adults. We would sing like barbershop quartet music and old songs by the drifters and the coasters and the adults loved it. And the kids, the kids at the bar mitzvahs or these other events would make fun of us. They would 
jeer at us and make faces at us as if we were the biggest losers in the world. So <laughs> then all of a sudden we get cast on this show and all of a sudden we become, you know, kids icons. And that was always hilarious to us. Uh, we always had sort of a, a weird love hate relationship with the show while we were on it because we wanted to be rock stars and rock mm -hmm. stars aren't kids acts rock stars you know have bevies of beautiful um groupies not kids yeah and so as soon as we, carmen san diego blew up uh and and we, we were touring we were a family act we didn't want to be a family act we wanted to be mm -hmm a cool act. So we, we were always fighting against that image. Um, at some point we simply had to embrace it because we, we weren't breaking through it on mainstream radio. Mm -hmm. We were simply the novelty act that was on Carmen San Diego. And we were, we had a decent career going. We were doing, you know, we were doing, I don't know, 70, 80, hundred shows a year and nice venues and doing, television commercials for different products and doing a lot of corporate work, which is very lucrative. Uh, and we had a, a parallel career in Japan recording albums for adults. So in Japan, we had that audience that we wanted. It, it was mostly young adults. Mm -hmm. And so that was the audience that we were always hoping to get in America. But in America, we, we were um, pigeonholed as a kid's act. Uh, so it was always a bit of a love hate relationship with Carmen San Diego. We, we knew that without Carmen San Diego, we probably had no career in America, but we also, it wasn't the exact career that we wanted. I was so funny that I like acapella music. It's been around for a long time, but I feel like more recently it's been thrust more into the mainstream. You guys feel like you were, ahead of the ahead of your time on it um because i well, feel like now you know somebody somebody recently uh posted something that said rockapella walked so pentatonics could run <laughs> and i get it yeah i get it even though i i resent the implication that somehow pentatonics just because they're tremendously more popular than Rockapella ever was, that they're somehow like better. Um, they're just, you know, different. And arguably Pentatonics arose on the shoulders of Rockapella and a bunch of the groups that came out of Rockapella's influence. When Rockapella yeah, started, uh, yeah, you know, there were very few groups that had that had vocal percussion and there weren't, you know, there was there was a handful of professional groups around the country. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm still friends with a lot of the people that were in those groups, groups like Ball in the House and Five O'Clock Shadow, a Cuban group called Vocal Sampling, my friend Deke Sharon's group. So there were a handful of groups that had that were doing rock music a cappella. Mm -hmm. Rock cappella became the biggest of them because of Carmen San Diego. Yeah, uh, and um, I, I like to I, you know there was plainly an explosion of acapella music, at, particularly on college campuses after, during and after the Carmen San Diego era. So yes, I, I take, I take credit, Rockapella takes credit for spearheading the explosion of acapella music in America, <laughs> possibly even around the world. You know, we, we had a Japanese record deal and we, we did a lot of clubs and a lot of television work in Japan between 1991 and 1997. Like we toured there eight times. We put out eight albums. Um, we were on doing commercials and everything. And the record company at the time in Japan told us that there was maybe like a couple of small acapella groups. All the acapella groups in Japan loved us and worshiped us. And now Japan has a huge acapella scene. Mm -hmm. And I think, a lot of that is because of Rockapella too. Next question here. Okay, this is from J.R. Green. And uh, he says, I loved every second of the show. 
And actually, I feel like we've already sort of addressed this question at this point, but it, he asked, was it fun to work on it? Uh, was it as fun to work on it as it seemed was his, was his question. Um, well, as I said, it was very, very hard work mm. in a very compressed period of time, usually two and a half or three months. Uh, so you probably, I, I recall it being late winter, you know, like February till through like March or April or it was, and so it was so, it was such a tremendous amount of hard work that I remember it just being utterly exhausted and you, and you think like, okay, only two more weeks of the schedule. Okay. I can, I can do it. I can, can and it, and as soon as the schedule is over, you breathe like this huge sigh of relief that you got through it. And then you're kind of sad that it was over. So everyone who worked on that show, uh, writers and um, set designers and the makeup people and even the accountants, a lot of us are still in touch because uh, in retrospect, the show was great for all of our careers mm -hmm. and we all really did enjoy it. But while it was happening, it was just really really hard work yeah i i did a retrospective on double dare as well beforehand and when i when i saw the shoot schedules for how many episodes would be filmed in a condensed period of time it, it's mind-blowing to yeah. think of how much everybody had to do and how like you just had to have your stuff together to be able to get through a schedule like that and yeah it's got to be really got to be rough uh yeah but, uh, I mean, that's that's one of the reasons why game shows are so uh, the economics behind game show game shows is really good because you can't shoot many episodes in one sitting. Mm -hmm. You know, once you get there's a sameness, you get the camera angles, the same thing happens. There's like a it's 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 like a choreography with the camera people and the um, and the lighting people. And once you get the formula down, it's like, boom, how many how many of these can you crank out? All right. My next question uh, is also, I believe we've also kind of tackled this already as well. So I apologize. Uh, this, is, this is from Jay Booth. Um, and uh, Jay says, I've always wondered whose idea it was to have an acapella group on a geography quiz show. Was it a network thing? Uh, did the showrunner come up with it or did the group suggest it? And I, obviously I, I know the answer to this already. And I yeah. feel like we've addressed it a little bit on here already too. So yeah. I mean, I, the, the brains behind the, the operation was a guy named Howard Blumenthal. He, you know, he was one of the early producers, also the first director of the, of the show, Dana Calderwood, who he's still a, a, a very successful working director. He was one of the producers as well. So between Howard Blumenthal and um, Dana Calderwood and, and, and the, the writers, and um, yeah, and I'm still in touch with a bunch of those writers, you know, really talented people. I still work with some of them sometimes. I think they, the combination of all of them was, um, came up with, all, with, with the shtick. And, but somebody saw us on Spike and Company do it acapella and thought, oh, that's an interesting idea. I don't know if they specifically were looking for an acapella group, mm -hmm. but I know that somebody saw us do that and thought oh an acapella group uh may be fun so I, I i'm not sure if i know that we auditioned and other groups auditioned too so i i, I don't know the answer to the question of um i know that we didn't suggest it right. i know they contacted us but i i don't know if them seeing us on that pbs special was the impetus for them even wanting an acapella group hmm. if if it's very possible though i think in one of the reunion uh, shows i watched with you guys somebody had mentioned the um I, and it showed footage from that special and i think it was the zombie jamboree song um you guys performed on there and i mean that song itself and i know you performed it on on carmen san diego but i mean just the aesthetics and the look and the feel of that if that's the the vibe they were going for and uh you mentioned mr blumenthal and i know that he was responsible for the overall aesthetic of the show i know that he um pulled a bunch of kids to ask like what do you 
what do you want out of a ki- out of a game show? And yeah. they wanted bright colors and high energy and characters, silly characters and stuff like that. And so knowing that that's kind of like that, that's what kids wanted. I could definitely see them seeing your guys' performance of Zombie Jamboree and be like, yes, that's what we want them. Yeah. yeah. And uh, Howard, Howard Blumenthal's dad was a very successful game show producer. I, mm. I think he produced one of the one of the, the huge games of the of the maybe of the 60s or the 70s. I forget oh, wow. which one it was, but it's one of the biggies. All right. Uh, last question. And this one is by far the most difficult are you I've, I've saved the biggest question for last sure all right here you go this is from michael perez and uh he says this is the perfect question for sean altman i know uh and that is where in the world is carmen san diego <laughs> all right well it's interesting the franchise still exists uh after after where in the world is carmen san diego pbs series went off the air um the same producers created a new show called Where in Time is Carmen San Diego. Yep. David Yazbek and I wrote the music and the theme song for that show. Uh, that was only on the air for a couple of years. Then there was a Fox, a Fox television cartoon called Where Where on Earth is Carmen San Diego. I submitted a few theme songs for that, rejected, and, and as a result, I had nothing to do with that show. Mm. Um, and then, uh, Netflix did a, a, a reboot, you know, so, cause the Carmen San Diego franchise has been owned by many different entities. It started out being a computer game by a company mm. called Broderbund Software. Mm-hmm. Broderbund, the, the originators of the, of Carmen San Diego, the character licensed it to PBS or specifically to WGBH uh television in boston which is the pbs affiliate in boston huge pbs affiliate and wqed pittsburgh the pb the pittsburgh affiliate and those two produced the the beloved where in the world is carmen san diego pbs show um but since then carmen san diego the car you know the franchise has been owned by houghton mifflin the big book publisher it's current then it was owned by someone else and now it's currently owned by another major publisher and the uh and netflix did that did the did a two or three season animated cartoon animated show with um, the actress gina rodriguez voicing the role of carmen san diego uh supposedly there's a live action movie in the works starring Gina Rodriguez. Uh, that show did license the theme song for me and from Yazbek uh, for use in promotions. And they they didn't want to use it as their own theme song right. because they thought it didn't fit, but they used it. They used the entire song in the final episode of the, of the Netflix series, <laughs> uh, the, the big interactive episode. So right. that was nice because I got paid. <laughs> um, and, um, and so that is that is where Carmen San Diego is now, but you know, as I said before, with that with those weird little clips that keep going viral, a week and a half ago, on Late Show with Stephen Colbert, he did a whole "Where in the World Is Rudy Giuliani" routine, where Stephen Colbert's band sang a verse and a chorus of the theme song. Tell me where in the world is Rudy Giuliani. <laughs> so. You know, the song and the character in the show are still very much a part of pop culture. So who knows where she is? I don't know, but uh, it's still, a, you know, it's still my biggest credit and a, a big part of my career. And uh, I love the character. I Every year at Halloween lately, I've been dressing as Carmen Sandiego. I'll show you a picture because I am a fetching Carmen Sandiego. Let's see. <laughs> Did I find it? Oh, there I am. <laughs> That's me. Love I love it. Carmen San Diego <laughs> and drag. <laughs> That's amazing. I have to tell you that 
And uh, when I made my joke about like me, is it, do I love the show? Or do I love the, do I love the band and the music. And I, I really do think that what you guys brought to the show, I mean, not just, not just the song, but your performances on, on the whole, your characters, your energy really, I think made that show what it was. I mean, and, and I'm not discounting, uh, what Greg and and Lynn brought to the show either because they were tremendous as well. But just like all of you guys working in harmony took that show from being what could have just been some boring geography quiz show to being just this super memorable and entertaining show. I mean, I honestly think that they need to reboot this. I mean, they rebooted Double Dare a few years back and yeah. it lasted for a few seasons. And I feel like Carmen San Diego needs to come back, you know, bring Greg in as the new chief and, you know, you can bring in a new <laughs> young blood as, as his, his, his counterpart. And then, you know, get, uh, I, you know, I, obviously I know that rock Capella is, is a very different uh, group than it was back then, different faces and stuff like that. But I mean, that theme song that that's got to stay. That's, that, that's yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. The theme song, um, Last year, Rolling Stone magazine named it one of the top 100 TV themes of all time, which is really nice. Prior to that, it had been on a, 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 li a, a bunch of short lists for best kids TV theme songs. But then Rolling Stone named it one of the 100 best TV theme songs, period, of all time. And you know, I grew up in the 60s and 70s, which was considered the heyday of um, TV theme songs, you know, with all mm -hmm. these amazing shows like I Dream of Jeannie and Mission Impossible and Bewitched and the Andy Griffith Show, all these, you know, Gilligan's Island, these songs, these theme songs that are a big part of the popular culture, the Adams mm -hmm. Family. Um, and for it to be considered in in that company is really flattering. And I'm uh, so, you know, so it's nice. And if, uh, if somebody does want to reboot it and they want to hire me, I'll, I'll, I'll do it. My career goes on. Uh, I've had a, I've had a really, you haven't asked, but I'll tell you what I'm doing now. After I quit Rockapella in 1997, which is a long time ago. Yeah. Since then I've put out um, four solo albums of my original music, two comedy song albums of my original comedy songs under the name Jumungus. Uh, I have another vocal group called the Groove Barbers, which uh, is has four other former members of Rockapella. We put out three albums, um, and and I tour constantly for the last uh, uh, seven years with the Everly Set and Everly Brothers tribute, and Forever Simon and Garfunkel, a Simon and Garfunkel tribute. So I'm working as much or more as I ever have. And if anybody wants to to follow me, you could check out seanaltman.com which is soon to be relaunched and uh before we started today you actually had mentioned that you're going on a tour for the summer uh can yes. they find information about those uh, cities and, and dates and yeah stuff uh, on your website as well? the ever the everly set.com the everly set.com you'll see information about uh both acts, the Everly set and forever Simon and Garfunkel. And uh, it's not just this summer. We tour constantly. Last year, we did about 100 concerts around the country. Oh, nice. And this year, we'll probably do 100 more. All right. I'll, and I'll make sure there will be a, a link to that as well in the description. Thank you. Okay. Also, I want to give a shout out to uh, Rockapella, which still exists. Yes, I haven't do. been in the group for many years, but Jeff Thatcher, the vocal percussionist on the season five of Carmen San Diego. And Scott Leonard, the high tenor, they you know they own the group, and uh, the membership has changed over the years. But it's the group is always great, and they're still touring, and they're still at rockapella.com. Thank you again so much for Thanks. taking time. I've, I've kept you longer than I intended to. Do I apologize for that? Oh, but... my, my my pleasure. It's always I'm always grateful that anyone wants to talk about this stuff. <laughs>
Thanks for watching everyone and a big thank you to Sean for taking time out of his busy schedule to talk with me. If you enjoyed the video, give it a like and a share. Don't forget to subscribe and click the bell icon to be notified when more of these videos go up.